screen. Um, okay. Um, on behalf on behalf of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, the Department of History, uh, the CHAS Anti-Oppression Committee, and the Center for Intersectional Gender Studies and Research, I would like uh, to welcome you to Sovereignty of the Soul, a conversation with Sarah Deer. Um, before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Utah State University and its campuses reside on the original territory of eight federally recognized tribes in Utah, including the Confederated Tribes of the Goshutes, the Navajo Nation, the Northern Ute Tribe, the Northwest Band of Shoshone Nation, the Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah, the San Juan Valley Band of Goshutes, and the White Mesa Band of the Ute Mountain Ute. We also acknowledge that Utah State University, like other land grant institutions, was built from the proceeds of native land dispossession under the 1862 Morrill Act. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this land, and we honor the, and respect the indigenous people that's still connected to the land on which we gather. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our, our panel uh, first, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Rachel Kilgore. Uh, she's a member of the Diné Navajo Nation. Her maternal clan is Towering House, born for the white people clan. She is from Gallup, New Mexico, and grew up in Chinle, Arizona, located on the Navajo Nation. She is a graduate student in the Combined Clinical and Counseling uh, Psychology Program at Utah State University. Uh, prior to grad school, uh, Rachel spent several years working in the anti-violence field in her community, at, advocating for victims and survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. She is very passionate about this work, and after graduate school, she intends on re, uh, returning to her community to provide clinical services to those who have experienced violence. Uh, Melissa Teehee is an assistant professor in the department of Psychology and the Director of the American Indian Support Project. She earned dual degrees, a PhD and a JD in clinical psychology, policy, uh, and law with a certificate in Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy at the University of Arizona. A citizen of the Cherokee, of the Cherokee Nation, uh, Dr. Teehee's clinical and research interests at, address trauma across the lifespan, including bias, prejudice, racism, health disparities, uh, domestic violence, and other trauma experienced by ethnic and racial minorities, primarily American Indians. She started volunteering with the, with the Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Crisis Center when she was 16. Throughout undergrad, she answered crisis calls and met victims at hospitals when they needed forensic evidence uh, collection her experience and inter interdisciplinary training allow her to consider the convergence of these issues with law and policy, including working on policies to address violence against Native women and considering how to start the healing process for families and communities. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Sarah Deer. Professor Deer is a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma and a, and a university distinguished professor at the University of Kansas, where she holds a joint appointment in women, gender and sexuality studies and the School of Public Affairs and Administration. Using indigenous feminist principles as a framework, Deer's pathbreaking scholarship focuses on the intersection of federal Indian law and victims' rights. Her award-winning book, the beginning and end of rape, confronting sexual violence in Native America, has transcended academic audiences to become a pivotal text for activists, demanding justice for Native women and for policymakers trying to stop the violence and heal the pain experienced by victims in their communities. She is widely published in the country's top law journals and has repeatedly testified before Congress uh, regarding violence against Native women. She was appointed attorney, uh, by Attorney General Eric Holder to chair a federal advisory committee on sexual violence in Indian country and serves as uh, the Chief Justice for the Prairie Island Indian Community Court of Appeals. Last but not least, Professor Deer was named a MacArthur Foundation Fellow in 2014. Um, 
We will begin with comments um, from Professor Deere and follow with questions facilitated by Professor Tihi and Rachel Kilgore. Thanks. Okay, should I go ahead and go? Yeah? Yes, Everybody yes. Please, please yes, do. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, and my, my screen is showing okay? Okay, great. Well, first of all, thank you so, so much for inviting me to this. I wish I could be there in person, but maybe next year, <laughs> um, we can hope. Um, this is a presentation that I've, I've worked on over the years and added things and changed things over the years. Um, and I'm really excited to be able to share sort of the, the current iteration of, of this uh, talk. And um, because, you know, this is a talk about um, sexual violence in particular, uh, it can be very, very um, emotional for people to hear what I have to say. I'm not gonna share with you any graphic information about sexual assault, any kind of graphic description of the crime, but because um, it's not possible to tell this story without some reference to sexual assault, um, I just want to encourage you if this raises personal issues for you, or you've had a family or friend one go through this, it's not unusual to have a lot of feelings come back if they haven't subsided. And um, so I know there's places on campus that you can turn uh, for support and uh, even if something happened a long time ago um, it's still a part of your life and so thank you for inviting me I'm currently at the University of Kansas and um, one of the things that's interesting about um, um, my uh, history is that interestingly enough the, the, the work that I started to do as a student has become sort of my life path and so I want to encourage students, if you have found a passion, you have found something in writing a paper or reading an assignment that just really grabs you, um, you know, that, that actually could be a turning point in your career. And for me, that's, that's sort of what happened. I started studying violence against Native women um, when I was in law school, and I haven't really ever looked back. I've had a variety of different kinds of jobs over the years, uh, but my research is sort of... Um, parallel to you know, what, what I've been working on. So um, I, I promise not to end on too bad a note because I think there's some really exciting things happening right now to support Native women and their families and um, to make sure that people receive the justice that they deserve. Um, so I'm gonna just start out by giving you some basic statistics. And as I mentioned, statistics even as dehumanizing as they are, uh, can be very upsetting for people to know. The federal government has released the most important data on violence against uh, Native women and men. Um, this, uh, this particular um, report is available for free online. Um, it's published in May of 2016, but it actually looks at data from 2010. You know, it takes a long time to sort of catch up with all the nuances that are gathered when people are trying to count the percentage of victims that we're dealing with. Um, so I want to share this with you from that report showing the rates of violence against um, Native women uh, in American Indian and Alaska Native people. Um, this is directly a, a graph that I cut and pasted from the report. Um, and so here we see that um, anytime lifetime violence, 80, over 84% of Native women will experience some form of violence in their lifetime. And over 56% of Native women will experience some form of sexual violence. And so we have a crisis on our hands. And I think the crisis has been going on for a long time, um, but these are unacceptable numbers. And so I have sort of dedicated my life to figuring out what we do about this crisis because it clearly is a, a, a unacceptable rate for our Native population. The other data that I wanna show you um, may not make sense until I get a little early, early, a little later in the presentation. But one of the most fascinating parts about crime and Native women and Native men is that we report on these studies that over 90% of our perpetrators are non-Native. Um, and that is very unusual in American law. Typically, when you're counting victims and trying to determine perpetrators, um, they're almost always of the same race in the United States, percentage-wise. 
So if you're a white victim, your perpetrator is more likely than not to be white. If you're a black victim, your perpetrator is more likely than not to be black. Um, and the only exception to that general rule, I guess, uh, findings is native women and men. So on the top two bars here, you see the number of female victims and male victims. These are native people who report that they have received violence at the ends of a non uh, or an interracial pro profile or someone from another race. Now, this is not to say that native people don't hurt each other. Um, they absolutely do, right? So you have a second set of bars here showing that both women and men report around 35% of their perpetrators are also native. Um, and you'll notice that these numbers then as a whole add up to more than 100. And that's because most native people experience violence more than once in their lifetime. Some of those crimes are committed by uh, non-Indian offenders and some of them are perpetrated by native offenders. I'll circle back to this data in a few slides when we talk about tribal jurisdiction. The other thing that the federal data doesn't show us is how um, often crime is committed against Two-Spirit or LGBTQ plus Native people. Um, there's never been a national study with national data on this particular question. The federal government has not been in, in the habit of asking these kinds of questions, but this is a population that's particularly vulnerable. So what I've done is I've pulled together some of the smaller studies that look at this issue, and they also show a very disturbing trend of um, sexual violence, physical violence, as well as bias-related victimization. Now, I hope at some point um, someone will be able to do a national data uh, collection of our two-spirit relatives so that they, um, they are getting the acknowledgement and the services that they need and deserve. But we just don't have national data on this yet. So when I think about where did we, how did we get to where we are, um, I, I started looking into some traditional practices of indigenous people. And the problem with this, uh, which is sort of the disclaimer for every presentation I give, give is that every tribal nation is unique. Um, they had their unique history, background, language, culture, and there are a wide variety of ways in which um, tribal members define for themselves, you know, what is an acceptable kind of behavior. But if we understand from what we know from some of our elders and other storytellers is that we did have systems to respond to violence and they were very victim centered. They weren't so much as what we think of as criminal law today. We didn't have a jail, nobody had a jail. There was no, no jails in an Indian country prior to arrival from um, Europeans, but we did have systems of accountability. And these systems tend to be victim centered and look more like what we would think of as restitution based. So the payment or the providing of goods and services to the victim was a common way in which tribes resolve these types of crime. Um, we also, um, so for the Muscogee Creek Nation, uh, we are matrilineal um, people. This is again, not, not necessarily all tribes, but in matrilineal societies, the lineage of a child runs through the mother. And so, whereas in the United States, in the typical dominant culture, a child takes his last, the last name of their father, um, this was a little bit of a different type of culture in which the identity of a child came through the mother's lineage. Now, whether or not this had anything to do with violence is a little stretch, but I do think that tribal nations that um, honored women and honored their role in the lineage of the people um, may have played a role in um, keeping Native people in line um, and, and presenting women as sort of the primary uh, agent of identity. When I was a law student, I started to study a little bit about the Creek Nation in particular, since that's where I've been a member of, um, and I couldn't find much about um, indigenous beliefs and protecting women, but I was really interested in finding something. So finally, my, um, my, my Indian law professor said, well, sometimes if you go back to the white, uh, uh, you know, the, the library of white people who were writing about Indians, um, sometimes that can be accurate. A lot of times it's not, it's very Eurocentric and um, 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 very defam defamatory. But I did find these passages from William Bartram, a white man, I think he was Quaker, who was sort of a Renaissance man and he, 
gathered um, all kinds of data, he decided to move down to where it is now Alabama and Georgia and spend some time learning about the plant life, the animal life, but also the people who lived there. And so he wrote lots of letters and journals around this issue um, and was particularly taken by the fact that he did not see things that looked like domestic violence to him, uh, not even speaking disrespectfully. Uh, to a woman. And of course, this was a little bit contrary to where he had come from, which was a very European style government where women didn't have any rights. Um, so I found this hopeful in many ways as a student to say, hey, you know, maybe we have this figured out. Maybe all of this data has, you know, come about despite this. And so that got me more excited about my research. Uh, again, I'm a law student at this time, just kind of working my way through the material. And um, I happened to find the very first written rape law from the tribe um, in 1824. And that's a particularly early time to find tribal written statutes. In the early 19th century, many tribal nations did not have a form of writing that we would understand today. They didn't have an alphabet um, or a way of using letters to convey ideas. And so these laws were probably passed down orally for a very, very long time. Um, and then at some point we were encouraged by our Indian agent, which is basically our federal overseer, um, that if we wanted to be treated as a, um, a civilized people, we had to write down our laws just like the white men did because that was the way they saw law. So they wrote these laws down in English, um, which is a little awkward because they clearly weren't passed in this format um, because the council members would not have had a way to write down things in Creek. So one of the um, sons of one of the chiefs decided to you know, you know, uh, satisfy the Indian agent by writing down he, what he understood to be the laws in 1824. Um, and many of the laws, they're primarily criminal laws, um, but, but they're very largely in sync with um, what state laws would have looked like then. Um, but there's this one exception and it has to do with sexual violence. And um, what caught my eye, obviously, is what I've put in red, which is what she say, the law. Um, and I'd never seen another law like that before where a victim would be centered in the decision making in the aftermath of sexual assault. So somehow, even though this was an assimilative process and it was an effort to sort of anglicize the Creek people, somehow this element remained. Um, and it certainly wasn't the law in the states, right? You know, women couldn't own property or even testify in some cases. So this idea that there was a culture out there, um, a system out there in place that would honor the choices of victims was something new to me. And it, it, it got me even more excited. Like maybe we had a way of, of keeping rape and domestic violence very low um, through these kinds of, uh, um, I guess, um, deference to, to the victim. So unfortunately, the next time the, the laws were written down was after removal, when we were re removed from our homelands to Indian territory. And by the time we got to Indian territory, we started to develop a written language um, with the help of missionaries who wanted to translate the Bible for us. So the next time you see the written laws is closer to the 1840s. And unfortunately, this segment about what she say be law had disappeared from the laws that were passed after removal. But we did have this little clue, a little nugget of insight into how things worked. So my question of, of my career is what factors explain the disproportionate amount of violence in the lives of Native people today? What caused that 83.7% um, rate of violence and 56.1% of sexual violence. That's a lot, that's higher than any other population in the United States. So how did that happen? What's the story of what happened to our people so that today we suffer the highest le levels of these kinds of crimes? So I think it's important to talk about sovereignty in a couple of different ways. Uh, sovereignty is really the concept that a nation or a government has the right to govern itself. So we kind of take it for granted in other contexts, right? So we, we don't really talk about the sovereignty of Kansas or the sovereignty of Utah, right? It's, it's a uh, given that these are states that have sovereignty and they have the decision to make laws and be governed by them. 
But when we come to tribal nations, it isn't as simple anymore because some of our powers have been diluted or lost or taken away from us so that we don't have what we would see as a full sovereignty um, expressed by tribal nations. But I also, having worked with over 500 rape victims during my lifetime, have found a parallel in many ways to what we might be called individual sovereignty. And by that, I mean an individual should have complete control over their lives, their bodies, and what people do to them and to their bodies. And um, I know that many rape survivors struggle with an identity crisis in a way uh, after being a victim of, of, of violence in this way. And so I see their sovereignty as an individual is very much tied to the power of a person to make decisions about relationships and their bodies. And so that has also been violated. Um, so we have sort of a double whammy. We have tribal sovereignty under attack, but we also have uh, the individuals who are rape victims who also are losing their sense of self and their sense of uh, their bodies and what will happen to them. So I'd like to talk about a couple of federal policies and then a couple of federal laws that I think help explain this question of how did we get where we are. So going back just a little bit, um, sovereignty and violence uh, intersect. Obviously, if somebody does something wrong in Utah or something wrong in Kansas, there's a system in place that's supposed to respond to that and provide justice for people. Um, and we did have those systems, but through the process of colonization and the process of uh, sort of attempting to modernize um, our, our, our tribal governments, um, we have seen our sovereignty depleted. Uh, we don't have the same power that other governments have. And I think that explains part of the reason why um, we have the high rates of violence that we do. So a couple of federal policies to uh, take into account are um, our, our removal. Removal was something that happened when um, basically white governments wanted the land that Indian, Indian nations occupied. And it was very powerful land in the sense that it was good plantation land. And so the, 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 the plantation and the chattel slavery that was practiced in the Southeast um, was uh, being hampered by too many Indians. And they decided they wanted to move these Indians to the West to Indian territory. And many people have heard of the Trail of Tears in the Cherokee context, but there were five tribal nations from the Southeast that were removed forcibly uh, to Indian territory. Now, we often talk about this as a tragic circumstance. We talk about it as a kind of blight on the history of the United States. Um, but you can see here, there's not just a trail of tears. There's many, many trails. And it was much more than tears that were involved. So people were, um, as the marches were going on, forcing us west, um, we were accompanied by the military. And what we know now is that there are members of the military who kidnapped Native women at their campsite when they were able to stop to sleep for a few hours and sexually assaulted the women and children in that community um, and then put them back on the trail the next day with no accountability, no courtrooms, no police, nobody to report it to. So by the time we get to Indian territory, of course, um, you know, we've been traumatized in so many different ways and it became a real challenge to try to reestablish a government, um, given that so many babies and so many elders had died on the journey and uh, were had to be buried in, you know, graves by, by the trails. So we talk about the Trail of Tears, but we don't always talk about the sexual violence aspect of it. So that's why I bring it up here. Um, removal was not limited to the south southeast. Um, it was all over, many, many tribes all over the country were removed to new places to make way for whatever you know, the United States government wanted. And this is a picture of some Diné women or um, Navajo women, what we might hear today, um, in, um, when they were in captured in a, a fort after removal. And we don't know much about this picture other than it was taken sometime in the 1860s. We're not sure why it was taken or who the photographer was, but we know that these women were captives. And for me, this is a, a, a symbolism. Um, you know, I look at this picture and I see devastation of a kind that, you know, um, is hard to really put into words, but I have to wonder if as being part of captives um, by the US military, if there wasn't also 
um, sexual assault that accompanied that. So the removal was not unique. And this was a policy that caused a lot of harm and brought a lot of sexual violence into our communities. <clears throat> we also know that indigenous land loss is what a lot of people talk about today. And a lot of people are doing land acknowledgements, um, you know, taking account of the fact that the land was uh, so stolen, swindled, um, uh, you know, lies were told about what would happen. And then over the years, right, to, we're left with very small plots of land. And again, that's bad enough in and of itself. But when I think about this in the context of sexual violence, one of the things that's important to understand is that um, a many, but not all, Native spiritual beliefs are centered around a geographic landmark. So it might be a river or a lake or a cliff or a mountain or some other landscape uh, that provides a place for people to go to find solace, to prayer, to do ceremony. Um, and that was the way you dealt with trauma, uh, is, to, is to turn to your creator and turn to the things that were meaningful. And so today, with all of the land being lost, there are many survivors in Indian country who are not who don't have access to those places anymore, right? And so when you're, again, looking at trauma and looking at ways to resolve trauma, if you don't have access to your sacred sites, uh, that trauma may actually amplify um, because of the lack of, of the ability to go to those, those sacred places. Um, so again, we've talked about indigenous land a lot, but I like to bring in that, um, the, the, you know, um, the, the experiences of, of uh, survivors over time. And then the final federal policy I wanna to speak to is the boarding school era. Um, which is, I know more, um, I call it brainwashing. Um, I, I don't suppose that's what people like to call it, but that's what I call it. So the idea was in the late 19th century that it was becoming very expensive to kill Indians. And that had been the policy, especially in the Northern Plains, the official US government policy was extermination, uh, but that was turning out to be more expensive. And so Congress was tr trying to find a cheaper way to sort of deal with the Indian problem, which is how it was presented. And so the idea was, let's take the children um, away from their communities and retrain them or brainwash them into not speaking their sacred language, not praying in a, you know, what they would perceive to be a heathen way um, and to really just recreate their personalities with no connection to Indians. And the phrase of the first boarding school, uh, Ted was um, Henry Pratt, and he said, uh, kill the Indian, but save the man. And so this is the same group of children. These are Apache children, uh, and they were taken uh, presumably against their will to Philadelphia. So we're talking about from the deep Southwest and, and trained, uh, put on trains to go to Philadelphia. And this is the, the next picture that's taken of this same group of children. So I'll go back and you can do a little mix and match, but these are the children before, same children just a few months later. So it was a very difficult time. Uh, children were punished for doing anything remotely indigenous. They were not allowed to speak their language and they were taught menial labor skills like washing, cleaning, welding, building things, uh, no sort of form of intellectual stimulation as it were. So this happened all over the United States and it continued well into the 20th century. So the unspoken issue here that I always point out is that you know, these were um, uh, places where uh, sexual predators could find a, a work and they could find access to children to abuse. And so many, many boarding schools, but not all of them um, were ripe with sexual violence and sexual abuse. Get my head a little bit here. Um, so I've talked about three policies. I've talked um, about removal, land, um, land loss, and boarding schools. And now I want to get back to more of the barriers to tribal jurisdiction. Why cannot tribes step in and protect people from violence? So I'm going to talk about three laws, sorry, two laws and one Supreme Court case. The Supreme, the first law that's passed is the Major Crimes Act. And the Major Crimes Act was passed in about 1885 in response to a pretty significant Supreme Court case that involved the death of one of these men by the other. So on the left-hand scene here, 
the left hand picture is a man named Crow Dog. And on the right, you see a, a creek, um, uh, not creek, uh, a Lakota man named um, Spotted Tail. And they were both rural Lakota chiefs, and um, they had a long standing feud about a lot of different issues, including the level of cooperation that they wanted to seek from the federal agencies. Uh, Crow Dog was considered more of a kind of a renegade. He resisted colonization. He fought back against efforts to take children to boarding schools. Uh, he wanted things to stay the way they were, whereas Spotted Tail tended to be someone who was more likely to compromise and find solutions along with the white community. And I don't know if that's the reason that Crow Dog killed Spotted Tail, but we do know that that's what happened. We know that Crow Dog shot and killed Spotted Tail. And of course, you, so you have a murder case. And the decision that was made by the tribe as a whole um, was not to send Crow Dog to prison because we didn't have those. Um, and so the punishment that was brought forward by the, uh, by the Crow Dog attorneys is that, you know, you'll, Crow Dog will now be obligated to provide goods and services and um, uh, material goods and money to a Spotted Tail's family for the rest of his life. And Spotted Tail had a huge, huge family. So basically, Crow Dog spent the rest of his life making amends to this family. Well, the federal government wasn't very happy about that because they saw Crow Dog walk as in their imagination is that he wasn't punished. And so because he was such a bad Indian, according to the federal agents, they decided to prosecute him in federal court rather than let the tribe decide. And so they, um, they arrested Crow Dog and they convicted him and they sentenced him to be hanged, which was for the white folks a, a better outcome. Um, but Crow Dog had a pretty good attorney and they actually appealed it all the way to the US Supreme Court. And in 1883, the US Supreme Court ruled in favor of Crow Dog. They weren't happy about it, but they said that's the law, right? They had treaties, the treaties have boundaries. There's no call for bringing a foreign government into that system and, and adjudicating them, right? Because they have their own laws and the, the whites have their own laws. And so Crow Dog did walk. I mean, I think he was still under obligations to the Spotted Tail's family, but he didn't get the punishment that the white community wanted. So they passed a law, Congress passed a law just two years later called the Major Crimes Act. Um, and this is still good law today. So this is still on the books in the federal code. Um, and it was a response to the Crow Dog case. So what this did is it unilaterally created federal jurisdiction over crimes committed by Indians in Indian territory. Uh, nobody, no tribe was consulted about this. The tribes didn't really even have a place to the to, to, to create a, a dialogue about this. It was just a unilateral imposition saying that white communities now had jurisdiction over Indians. And it was so, certainly something that we didn't ask for. So, um, so that's what we're working with today. And what that means is that on most reservations in the lower 48, which, which is, but with some exceptions, some significant exceptions, but by and large in the lower 48, um, the Major Crimes Act remains the good law today. So <clears throat> if a native woman is sexually assaulted on a reservation, um, the federal government prosecutes that crime if they decide to. And most rape in the United States is a state court issue, right? So um, this is unusual to have the federal prosecutors and the FBI involved in an interpersonal uh, dispute, even, even murder. Um, and, and so we didn't ask for that. They just imposed it on us. It was sort of the tautological, we have the power because we say to you, we say we do. So this put a real, um, there was a real intrusive nature to this, right? That, that the federal prosecutors would be the ones to, um, to take care of crime like this. Unfortunately, over the years, they have not done a very good job. And so many victims are left without justice. The second law I want to talk to you about is from 1968, and it's called the Indian Civil Rights Act, um, which sounds like a great idea, right? Civil rights in the 60s, 
can't be a bad thing. You know, we were making so much progress. But in fact, what the Indian Civil Rights Act did in 1968, it, 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 is, it does a lot of things, but the one that I wanna focus on is the sentencing limitation. Um, so as of 1968, Congress limited the ability of any tribal court anywhere in the land to a maximum penalty of one year incarceration or a $5,000 fine or both. Um, and so if you're going to try a case in tribal court, like a crow dog case or a case of rape, the maximum penalty that the tribal courts can impose is limited to one year. And this has created some fascinating conversations about the carceral response to violence and whether or not tribal nations really want to incarcerate. But we are limited in the ability to do that. And again, it was done unilaterally with no tribal input. And then finally, I want to talk about Oliphant versus Suquamish, which is a Supreme Court case from 1978. Um, and in this case, there were a couple of white men who were living on the Suquamish Reservation, which is in Washington state. And they lived there and they worked there and they were got a little drunk and disorderly um, one night. And so a couple of the tribal police officers tried to arrest them. Um, Oliphant punched one of the tribal police officers um, in the in the face. Um, and so there was there was just this drunken, disorderly kind of typical thing. So of course, Suquamish brought them into tribal court to try them for their crimes. And the Supreme got went all this way to the Supreme Court again. And the Supreme Court said that from here on out, until Congress changes something, um, tribal nations shall not be allowed to prosecute non-Indians no matter what they do, whether it's you know, burglary, uh, vandalism, rape or murder or child sexual abuse. Uh, if it's a non-Indian committing the crime, the tribal nation has no criminal jurisdiction over them. So this has been devastating. And this is why I asked you to remember the slide that I showed you earlier um, with the high, high rates of non-Indian perpetrated violence. And I think some of that has to do with Oliphant versus Suquamish. I don't think it's the total explanation, but it certainly doesn't help the situation um, when we have far more uh, non-native perpetrators that we're dealing with. So by the end of the 20th century, um, we are limited to prosecuting only members of federally recognized tribes. Um, our, our, our sentencing limitation is a one year uh, for any crime. And of course, we are poor. Native nations are, are very poor for the most part. And a criminal justice system is the most expensive uh, government um, entity that we have. It's extremely expensive to prosecute crimes. Uh, you have to have a courtroom, you have to have a bailiff, you have to have your codes online. There's just a lot of things that have to be in place. And most tribes are not in a financial ability to take on uh, take on a lot of these cases. Um, and so um, it's important to note though that tribal nations can in some cases create criminal justice systems that differ from the Western law and order system. So even though there's a limitation on jail, jail time, uh, there might be a way of in, inducing some sort of therapeutic response that doesn't involve sort of punitive measures to try to deal with some of these problems. So we were successful, I'm almost done. There's a couple successful uh, changes made to the law um, that I was excited to be a part of. And one uh, was signed in 2010 by President Obama. And it addresses a lot of different aspects of federal Indian law. But the one that changed the game in terms of um, changes to what we will fight, were fighting against is that this law now allows up to three years um, for sentencing for a tribal government. So they can sentence up to three years per offense, which may not seem like a big step, but believe me, it was a fight. Um, and for some survivors, that might be the difference. I'd rather have him, he, him gone for three years rather than one, um, but there really is no justifiable reason to limit tribal sentencing at all other than paternalism. And then we were able to pass the uh, Violence Against Women Act in March of 2013. And this is a pic picture of the sig signature event again. Um, and this was a big, huge step in the right direction because in this law, uh, tribes are allowed to prosecute non-Indians. For the first time since 1978, tribes can prosecute uh, non-Indians, but it's very limited. 
the only non-Indians that can be prosecuted are those that live and work on the reservation and who have a relationship or former relationship with a member of the tribe. Um, and so it's really limited to domestic violence. It does not cover child sexual abuse. It does not cover rape, does not cover homicide. Um, but for now, we do have the ability to practice um, uh, crime control against non-Indians who commit acts of domestic violence. But don't worry, we're going back for more. There's gonna be a new VAWA proposed very soon, and we hope that those corrections are put in that bill. We also have worked over the years in the Supreme Court, um, uh, trying to raise the issues of violence against Native women and girls and men. Um, and we got involved in a civil action um, against Dollar General. You all know the Dollar General stores, they're the white with the black. Uh, but anyway, the Dollar General Corporation didn't want to cooperate with the Mississippi Choctaw uh, when one of their managers molested a young boy in the back of the Dollar General store. So he's white, so you can't, you know, the tribe can't prosecute him, but they did dismiss him and banish him from the reservation. But no criminal justice is available here. So the parents actually filed a civil personal injury lawsuit in Choctaw Tribal Court trying to look for some form of justice for their child, um, you know, medical bills, counseling, any health issues that came of it uh, would be covered then by Dollar General. Um, and so we decided to write a brief um, in the Supreme Court case to inform um, the court that this was not just about one case and one child, that this has the potential to affect all victims throughout Indian country. And so we were successful in filing that brief. Um, and we got a tie, a 4-4 tie. That was the year that uh, Justice Scalia passed away in his sleep. And so we're only left with eight justices and uh, they couldn't make a decision. They were equally divided. But we had won, or Choctaw had won at the lower court, and so that now is, is the law and the case can proceed in tribal court. We've also filed briefs in several other cases that involve violence against Native women. Um, our upcoming case right now is Cooley versus United States, has to do with tribal police power. Um, but the other three uh, briefs we've written, granted they weren't briefs on the merits, there were briefs on behalf of Native women and children, um, but we were, we've been successful uh, thus far, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the Cooley case. Um, so thank you again for having me um, with this great opportunity for me to share you some of the information I have, and I really look forward to engaging in some Q&A with all of you about questions you have about my work. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. That was wonderful. Um, we do have a question coming in. I think we can start with ours and then and then go to audience questions. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that sounds perfect. Thank you. Um, so that was a lot of history, and it was nice to hear all of that history um, because it has such an impact on today. Um, so I really appreciated that. So you have a history in being an advocate, working with victim survivors. Um, and I found that just wonderful because I have the same history. Um, Melissa's worked in the field as well. How did this influence your decision to pursue law and the type of law? Thank you for that question. Well, when I entered law school, I'd been a rape crisis counselor for about six or seven years before I went to law school. Um, working but through through while I was in undergrad and in law school, I was the I was an on call advocate. Um, uh, I had my one of my one of the very first cell phones ever invented uh, because we were using beepers or pagers before that. So I had this huge cell phone with this really long antenna you had to pull out, um, and that was where the crisis calls came into. Um, and I sat through, so I, I worked with, you know, dozens and dozens of survivors in the emergency room, making police reports and that kind of thing. But what I found uh, most compelling was the trials um, when the state would pursue charges against a, a person who had harmed someone, um, maybe one of the people I worked with. And I sat through probably 10 or 15 jury trials over the years from start to finish. 
And um, I had been a big debater in high school and always liked to give public speeches and, you know, do those kinds of things. And I watched carefully, I watched how sex, sex crime prosecutors did their work. Um, and yeah, I felt very strongly that I, I could do as good, if not better, um, especially where it came to victim compassion and keeping them in touch and keeping them informed. And so that's kind of what led me to law school. Um, and, um, and then of course I never worked as a sex crimes prosecutor. <laughs> just, I advise my students all the time is don't leave any door closed, you know? So, um, so yeah, but that was my main impetus to go to law school is because I didn't like the way I saw victims being treated by prosecutors um, just as mere witnesses. And some of them were kind, but that wasn't their role, you know, the, to, to, to be the handholder. So I thought, well, maybe I can be that kind of prosecutor. Um, but then I fell in love with Indian law. Um, and so I ended up taking a little bit different uh, journey in, in, my, in my work. But um, that's the reason I decided to go to law school. Thank you. So um, Rachel and I were also talking and you advocate for changing rape culture. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, you know, some people here might not know what that, what rape culture is, but right. in, in sort of sharing with us about that, what are ways we can work on changing rape culture generally? Well, I think we have to talk more a lot about it and that becomes hard to do, um, you know, because, you know, I've been on speaking tours and doing all of these things, but I don't have the answer. Um, but rape culture really is an understanding that, um, that um, violence is on a continuum. So on the one hand, you may have a non-criminal act, like a rude comment about somebody's body shape or mocking someone who has big breasts or something, sexual harassment type stuff that doesn't necessarily uh, you know, correspond to a crime per se. And then on the other end of that spectrum, you have uh, murder, um, sexual you know, violence-based murder. And most of the things that I think people like me um, work on uh, a daily is more of that centered section. So beyond the sexual harassment and not quite up to the murder cases, but how do we stop rape now? Um, and so I, I just, I think that universities and, and colleges are, are key um, to start these conversations that people can, can then take into the workplace. Um, but not everybody believes that rape culture exists. Some people just think, well, there's just some people who rape, but it has nothing to do with our culture. But our culture, as you can see now, was predicated on rape in many ways um, in terms of contact with European law. And, um, and so can we go back to that time period before contact? Probably not. Um, but I do have hope that the more people who are educated about this then can recognize it and then speak up in whatever way, whether you're gonna write an op-ed for a newspaper, you're gonna be spending an hour or two talking to a victim. Um, everybody's place in the, in, the, in the work to end rape is gonna look a little differently. And even if it's not your career choice, it's something you can still do as a volunteer, right? So if you, if you wanna be a chemist, go be a chemist, right? You don't have to center your whole life around this issue, but you may have an opportunity to volunteer as an advocate. Um, and so in that way, you can be part of that ending of rape culture, even though it's not your full-time job. I hope that's helpful. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, we've got another question for you. Um, how is the persistent development of fossil fuels in and around indigenous communities connected to the escalating violence against native women? You had touched on this in your book. It would be great if you could address it here today as well. Yeah, um, so we call, um, there's, a, there's a real parallel between violence against women and, and extractive industries, like uh, particularly fracking, um, which I don't really know what that means, but I know it causes earthquakes in weird places like Kansas. <laughs> We're not used to them at all. Um, so what happens a lot of times is that, um, you know, an oil company extraction industry uh, finds a place um, like in the Bakken oil fields where they find a ton of oil that you would get by fracking and in order to or, or build a pipeline or both. 
And in order to um, uh, create that industry there, they have to bring in a lot of, a lot of people, mostly men, um, some of whom have nowhere else to go because they're sex offenders or they've you know, done other things that got them into trouble and it's hard to find a job. And so um, they bring these men, they set up kind of shanty camps. They might be mobile homes or trailers or um, you know, more high-end tents, but they have to live there for a while. They have to live there um, while they're doing the work and they're making a lot of money fast. And so what has happened is correlating with the extractive industry is a high, higher increase in native women being targeted. Um, and that has happened. There's numerous anecdotal information and some empirical work that's going on right now to try to explain why bringing in a whole slew of thousands of white men um, who may already have been sex offenders themselves, because that one might be the only job they can get, um, that it has brought um, to a serial rape and, and child sexual abuse um, from, from that community of workers. I don't want to blame everybody for, uh, for choosing that job, but um, but there is a significant number of sex offenders that come into the community and live there, and um, and and we don't always know who they are. So so that's a challenge that we're trying to face when we oppose the pipeline. We also include this information about violence against women, not just violence against the environment, which is you know enough harm as it is, but that it's accompanied um, by um, by violence perpetrated against Native women and children. Thank you. I'm going to go to some of the um, questions asked by the audience. Um, so somebody asked about tribal membership and sort of who determines who can be a member of a tribe or, or the considerations there. So when thinking about sort of if somebody is a tribal member, that makes, you know, there's all these differences that happen legally. Yes. Um, well, membership is another, you know, semester long topic. <laughs> the short answer is that tribal nations are in charge of making de decisions about who can, who, who qualifies for citizenship and who doesn't qualify for citizenship. But typically in order to um, arrest and prosecute uh, somebody, they have to have um, an indigenous some proof of indigeneity, whether that's a birth certificate that connects someone to the tribe or someone who's enrolled or someone whose child is eligible for enrollment, but they just haven't gotten around to it yet. Um, but typically what the federal, I'm sorry, for what the uh, uh, tribal governments are going to have to show is that this person is an Indian for legal purposes. And because there's so many different kinds of membership schemes that tribes have, um, it may not always be obvious whether somebody can be held accountable. So they have to kind of go do some dirt, dig into some dirt and find out the relatives and find out if indeed this person is an Indian and therefore eligible for uh, prosecution. So basically go by the tribe's decision. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, like thinking about how complex all of this is and asking a police officer to decide in that moment, right? I mean, there, there are so many complexities. Um, I, I people, teach this, I teach oh, this topic in a, in a semester long, um, you know, topic because there's so many nuances that I can't cover in a short presentation, so. Absolutely. Um, another question here is, about sort of the upcoming, you know, you had mentioned there are some things up and coming. So with the Violence Against Women Act or um, other increases to, to tribal jurisdiction through Congress or through policies. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the goal, the Violence Against Women Act expired in 2017. Yeah, it's supposed to be authorized every year, three years, so maybe 2016. Um, and um, it didn't get passed. Um, we tried a 20, let's see, what year is it today? I'm getting so confused now. Um, we were looking at VAWA um, again in 2012 when Obama, when Obama was still in office. And um, 
after we got the violence, the domestic violence offenders included in, in the um, jurisdiction that we can now um, impose, uh, we want to go back now. And in the most recent version that was um, being debated in, uh, shoot, I want to say it was 2018, 2019, um, we ended up with two different versions of VAWA. Um, one passed the house and it was the good one. And then there were two different versions um, floating in the Senate. And one of the ones that was floating in the Senate was basically the same as the house bill. It would have re 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 we returned jurisdiction um, over non-Indians who commit homicide, child sexual abuse, rape, and assault on a police officer. And things were looking pretty good. I mean, hard, it's hard to argue with that, right? Um, but uh, the unfortunately, VAWA has become a partisan issue. It was originally a bipartisan act back in 1994, um, and the Republicans didn't want to budge, and the Dem Democrats weren't going to budge because the the, the the Republicans took the tribal jurisdiction out of it. Um, and so we were up there trying to figure out how to make some kind of compromise to help the Republican senators understand what was at stake. Um, and then COVID came. So we, we, have to, we had to kind of put it on hold, like a lot of us had to put a lot of things on hold. Um, but now that Biden is president, he was one of the original co-sponsors of VAWA back in 1994. So he's still kind of, you know, got some you know things to say about it and he he understands tribal sovereignty a little bit so we're hopeful that we can push something through um during the um the first biden administration because there's a lot of energy behind it and there's a lot of people who have already been working on it so we don't have to start from scratch um but that's that's the kind of thing that we're going to be um asking for in in our new VAWA bill that's really exciting. I'm happy to hear that. Um, so epidemic is a term that's often used. Um, and you, you talk about this, you, you reference this in your book, and you talk about um, epidemic is not is, is misleading, right? Mm -hmm. And so can you speak more to that? Yeah, so that's kind of a line that either people love or people hate. And you don't find out some of these things until the book is published. So I, I kept seeing this term epidemic and um, my husband actually stu studies <laughs> pandemics and disasters for a living. So we are, we are quite the fun pair. Um, uh, and um, uh, let's see. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out which question this was again. Can you remind me what it was? Oh, uh, the, uh, the, the term epidemic, it's often oh, used and, and totally so I forgot that. Yeah, no, so, <laughs> so, so for me, you know, as a lawyer, when I'm looking at, I use stats from all different kinds of disciplines, you know, anything I can get my hands on that might help us get our head wrapped around this problem. So I, I always read medical literature. I read, you know, forensic nursing literature. I read any study that people have done that might be helpful. Um, I have a stack of books, about 15 feet tall that I have not even gotten into yet. Um, but for me, when I was thinking about epidemic as a lawyer, I'm thinking about um, a flu epidemic, right? Uh, and this book was written long before COVID, but I, I thought about it as a germ, as a disease that has a biological principle. Um, and so I'm like, why are we calling, this is not a disease, this is a human made condition. Um, and so I took that, um, idea and I want to start the book with that like we really need to re reclaim this because this is not something that's out of our control um, like an out of control um, epidemic like this is this is a crime this is not a you know a biological tick point so um, so people have resonated with that quite a bit um, because it, it really kind of changes the framework in which we think about sexual violence um, that it is a human-made problem that has nothing to do with biology but what's interesting about that, and when you write a book and then people start talking to you, they have their ideas. And sometimes if you're a first time writer, you are just horrified. But she said she was a medical anthropologist and she'd read my book and she said, I really take issue, you know, with you distinguishing the two um, because every epidemic is political. Um, every epidemic has a political component to it. And we've seen that with pandemics, the, the COVID pandemic is there's not a one size fits all. There are people that are hurt more than others. 
and that has largely to do with politics. And I think that's been made perfectly clear in the last few months um, is that epidemics can be inherently political. And uh, one of my colleagues in the women's studies department studies the, the AIDS movement. And so we talked about that a little bit and she goes, yeah, I'm so, uh, epidemics can be political. <laughs> um, so so I, I still use it just to try to get people's framework to change a little bit, but, um, but yeah, it's not wrong to call it an epidemic now that I have a better understanding of how that's used in the medical field and particularly medical anthropologists um, who've, who've called me out on that. So I think it, I stirs up a great discussion. And so I, if I ever, you know, do a second edition, I'm gonna leave it in there, but maybe provide some, some counterpoints to it as well. So I'm wondering in the in the last couple of minutes, what we're going to go just a couple of minutes over. But storytelling is is really an integral part of many Native communities, and I'm wondering if there is a story you want to share with us to sort of wrap things up tonight. Well, sure. Um, and I have her permission to talk about this, and she's public. Um, um, but uh, there's a woman um, from the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. I think that was the correct one. Maybe call, I don't know, I can't remember exactly, but her name um, uh, is escaping me now. I'll think of it in just a second. Anyway, um, when B Obama signed VAWA in 2013, she was one of the first speakers. Diane Millich, that's her name, Diane Millich. And she was um, one of the, the potential um, homicide victims that would be caused per primarily because of the Olivant decision. So she had kind of a sweetheart, you know, very wonderful relationship with um, a white man. Um, they lived in her home on the reservation. And like we hear so tragically after the marriage, things got bad. And um, she was, he punched her for the first time like a week after their, med or their wedding. Um, and he told her no one can stop me because he knew the law. And he knew that the tribe would not be able to arrest him. This is all, you know, again, pre vawa 13. And, um, and nobody would help her. And sometimes he would call just to prove to her that he could get away with it because the counties didn't have jurisdiction there because they don't have a criminal authority on the reservation. And the tribe couldn't do anything about it other than issue protection orders, which he then invariably violated. Um, and he finally showed up at work one day with a gun and uh, her coworker um, laid on top of her. And he, he was the one that was shot. He lived, thankfully, but Diane was not hurt. Um, and at that point, then there was action from the feds. Um, and she gave a wonderful moving speech at the 2013 signing um, about her story and about how um, VAWA 2013 allowing the tribe to prosecute someone like him, even though he's white, he's living with a native woman on a reservation and he's beating her regularly. Why on earth would we want the tribe um, to not have authority over intervening there? And so her story really, um, you can find it on YouTube, probably some White House archive, uh, YouTube of VAWA 2013 signing Diane Millich. <laughs> and she gives this wonderful speech about how her life would have been so different if you know the, what the laws in VAWA 2013 had been enforced when she was a victim. So you know I don't want to put it on every victim that you owe the world all the gory details of your story. That's your story. That's nobody else's story. But she chose to make it public because she felt strongly that it showed that she'd survived and that she was involved in changing the law. And so those are those are the really um, wonderful moments that I've had a chance to witness when we try to make changes to these laws. So it's Diane Millich, M-I-L-L-I-C-H. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to kind of uh, draw this to a close. This part. I can't hear you. Yeah, we can't. We can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, I don't know what's wrong. We, we can kind of hear you. 
Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, that's good. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Uh, I just wanted to draw this to a close and I want to thank everyone for participating, especially uh, Professor Deere. I really enjoyed uh, your talk. It was very uh, enlightening. And, um, and uh, I just wanted to let the audience know that there is a kind of resource page for those of you interested in pursuing the uh, more information about the about the topic and uh, just check our uh, there's in the chat there's a link, um, but also on the announcement for the event so thank you everyone I really enjoyed uh, meeting you all or meeting Sarah, Sarah and uh, and I'll, thank you so much. Thank you and if students have more questions, you can Google me and find me at ku.edu.